welcome to the Health, Wealth, and Happiness Show. Our guest today is Howard Pink. Howard Pink is a multi-talented, lip-buzzing, musical instrument performer. <laughs> I have to read all this, Howard. Uh, Howard is a professional French hornist for over 55 years, over 30 years performing his educational and entertaining show. He has a Bachelor of Arts, I'm sorry, Bachelor of Music mm -hmm. degree from Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. He is a former member of the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra for 33 seasons. He is a former faculty member of the University of New Orleans, University of La Paz in Bolivia, and he is, was also, it was when you were a, I a was member in the Peace in Corps. The Peace Corps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to say, take it away, Howard Pink. Okay. Appreciate you being Thank here you very today. much. I <laughs> okay. appreciate it. Great. We have this gorgeous horn, which I'm sure you're sitting at home going, Ricola. And thanks to the Ricola commercial, this horn became very visually popular. But it's not called a Ricola horn, it's called an Alp horn, A L P H O R N. It's made entirely out of wood. It's even played with a wooden mouthpiece. But it's so long, you can't hold it up in your hands. And you notice up here where my fingers are, I do not have any keys. And all the sound comes out down there at the bell. And of course, you're very familiar with the Ricola commercial. Ricola. <laughs> And that was probably all you heard during the TV commercial. But this horn is nothing more than my French horn, 15 feet long, made out of wood. I can play on this Alp horn anything I can play without using keys on my French horn. We could take this into the army, wake up the soldiers in the morning. <laughs> Wouldn't this be a joy to take out to the racetrack to start the horse races? Even Beethoven used the Alphorn in his Symphony No. 6. The symphony is subtitled the Pastoral, which is a scene out in the mountains, in the valleys, and there was a thunderstorm with the timpani being the thunder, the cymbals being the lightning, the strings imitated the sounds of raindrops, then when the sun came out the flute imitated the sounds of a bird call, and at the end of that movement Beethoven remembered what the Alphorn sounded like and he wrote this beautiful part for the French horn. Now I'll do a little bit of Beethoven and then I'll ad-lib a little bit so that you can hear the beautiful high and low notes of the Alphorn. <laughs> So there you have the beautiful sounds of the Alphorn. Many people say, do I have a long, skinny car? How do I transport this horn? Well, it does come apart in three sections. And fortunately, I have a car that has, where the armrest is in the back seat, there's also a trap door. So I can put the small end of the Alphorn halfway into the car, and the big end of the Alphorn fits into the trunk. And that's how I transport it around. Now, 15 feet, you think, is a pretty long horn. The man who built my Alphorn, his name is Peter Wutherick, he came to us from Switzerland. He eventually settled in Boise, Idaho. As a matter of fact, this horn is made out of, of a Boise spruce tree. Peter Wutherick holds the Guinness Book of World Records for building the longest and largest Alphorn ever. Ten times longer than this horn, measured at 154 feet, 8 inches long. 
It has its own separate trailer, comes apart in 27 sections of tubing. The plain end of the horn is about as big as my horn. Where it gets humongous is at the other end. Four grown men could stand inside the bell of the world's longest and largest alp horn. So we can make our horns 15 feet long. You can make them 154 feet long. We can also make them smaller. You remember my miniature French horn with the keys and everything. Well, from about 200 years ago, we have a wonderful little horn that comes to us from England. It's called a post horn. Some people have referred to this as my donut horn because it resembles a donut right here, has a built-in mouthpiece and a little teeny bell. Inside the leather wrapping is a couple of circles of brass tubing. Again, this has a clever name. It was called a post horn, but it's spelled with P-O-S-T-E because in England they love to add E's to the end of words. It was used by the postman when he was coming to your house on his horse, and he would blow the post horn, blow signals to let you know that here comes the post. So you have the post horn. Can we make our horns even smaller? Oh, uh, yes. You remember the hunting horn? If you look carefully at the end of the string that I'm holding in my hand, I have for you now the world's smallest plain hunting horn. It has its own built-in mouthpiece, its own little bell. It does not have any keys, of course, and it does not have the conical tubing. The tubing is the same size from the beginning as it is to the end. Therefore, when I put a buzz into the mouthpiece, all that comes out the bell is a little teeny tiny buzz. Now, some people have said, oh, we put this on our holiday trees during Christmas time. Well, after you see my show and you learn about buzzing the lips, you can entertain your family and friends with your horns before you put them on the holiday tree. The secret is to get your lips small enough to be able to buzz in this working end of the mouthpiece. Uh. So once again, as long as you can buzz your lips, buzz into a mouthpiece, a buzz or a tone will come out the end of your horn. And what does all this have to do with the title of the show, Howard Pink and his musical garden hoses? Because the garden hose is nothing more than an empty tube. Here's a garden hose that I actually brought back from Bolivia. It's over 45 years old now. They don't make garden hoses with this hard rubber anymore. And you notice I've cut the end that would hook to the faucet of the house. I've also cut the coupling off that you would put your sprinkler on because I need to be able to put a mouthpiece inside one end of the garden hose. And then I always thought, wouldn't it be beautiful if I could use my cone as a bell for my garden hose, except there is no hole at the small end. And then if I decide to put the big end over the garden hose, of course, it blocks up the hole and nothing will come out. So clever me, I found out that if you go into the kitchen drawer and you find a little funnel, you can put the funnel right inside the garden hose. And now we have our mouthpiece at one end, we have our tubing, and we have the bell end of our horn. So all you need to do now is blow into it, right? You notice once again, only air comes out if you don't buzz your lips. You buzz your lips into the garden hose. You start to get a sound. But of course, I call these musical garden hoses, which means I have to perform music on them. I found out this garden hose is a wonderful garden hose, the size of it at least, for playing nursery tunes. You all recognize this one? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Simple old pop goes the weasel. Another thing I discovered, and it's mainly because I sit around and music is going in my head all day long. I was thinking about Pop Goes the Weasel one day and I started moving the notes around just like I would do in my garden hose. Shake them up, change the position, and I found out that if you use the same notes from Pop Goes the Weasel, you can actually play another nursery tune. <laughs> So you can actually get the farmer in the dell with the same notes as Pop Goes the Weasel. You just have to change the order around. Simple enough, your own plain old variety garden horn. Only if you learn how to buzz your lips, you can actually make it a musical garden hose. You just need a mouthpiece. Now, it doesn't have to be a French horn mouthpiece. If you happen to have your old trumpet around from high school, you can use your trumpet mouthpiece, trombone mouthpiece. A tuba mouthpiece might be a little too big to put in the end of your garden hose, but it's worth a try because garden hoses come in different sizes. And we've talked a lot today about big horns, small horns. You saw my alp horn at 15 feet long. A lot of people think that that's the longest horn I play. But actually, if we would unwind my French horn, it would stretch out to the length of this garden hose. Now, how did I figure that out? One day, I took my horn apart as best as I could, and I went in the garage, and I got a ball of string. And I took the ball of string, and I laid the string against every inch of tubing on my French horn. Then I went into the utility drawer. I got a very sharp knife. I took my string outside, visited my backyard garden hose, took the knife, and I cut the garden hose the length of the string which I used to measure my French horn. Most of the air goes around the sides because it's very difficult to focus the lips into this hole. And you wonder how did people play these kudu horns then? Well, the interesting thing is if you look at movies where people are playing animal horns, they very seldom play them out of the front of their mouth. They put the horn just on the corner of their lips like this, and then they have to buzz their lips into the horn from the side of their mouth. Still a very difficult instrument to play. And I found out, though, the end was cut off just the right size so I could take my French horn mouthpiece, put it inside, and now by vibrating my lips from the front end like I've been doing for about 55 years on the French horn, you notice on the kudu horn we can get three notes. Why do we get three notes on the kudu horn? And only one note, say, out of the cow's horn? Because the difference in length. The longer the horn, the more notes you can play. The kudu horn is three times longer than my cow's horn. Now, for those of you who don't happen to have a cow's horn lying around the house, I can show you some technique that you can practice at home using your plain old ordinary fast food soda straws. Again, I use my kudu horn technique. I don't play them on the front of my lip. I put the straw inside the corner of my mouth. Now this straw happens to be a right-handed soda straw, so I put it in the right corner of my mouth and I hold it in my right hand. Just buzzing my lips into the soda straw. Here I have a left-handed soda straw. I put the left-handed straw into the left corner of my mouth. Right-handed. Left-handed. You notice both straws make the same sound because they are the same size. You want to try a little challenge? Take a straw, put it in the left corner of your mouth. Take a straw, put it in the right corner of your mouth. Buzz out of both corners of your mouth at the same time. But again, the straw is a small instrument. It only plays one sound. Thankfully, we have scissors. If you take the scissor, cut your straw, you can get a different sound. In the big straw, you have to remember this cute little poem, buzz your lips slow to play low. 
In the little straw, you buzz your lips faster to play higher. You can hear the difference in sound. Slow to play low. Fast to play high. You want another challenge? Put the big straw in one corner of your mouth. Put the little straw in the other corner of your mouth. The trick is, buzz your lips slow to play low in the big straw. Buzz your lips fast to play high in the little straw. Try to do it at the same time. And if you want a real treat, make your straw super small. Now you have to buzz your lips at almost supersonic speeds. And one of the things I learned, when you buzz your lips so fast, if you don't hold one corner of your mouth closed, the air tends to leak out of it. So you put the little straw in the corner of your mouth, hold one corner closed. And once again, you notice each straw only makes one sound. But that's the way we get the different sounds that we know. So we didn't have straws about 800 years ago. Somebody was really brilliant, found out that if they melted brass, they could make like a brass horn. Not an animal horn, but a brass horn. We call this a hunting horn. No keys for my hands, no slides here in the middle. Even the bell is too small for me to put my hand inside. But there is a receptacle for the mouthpiece. And again, if I just blow in my hunting horn, nothing comes out but hot air. The minute I buzz my lips, and I found out this horn is about a foot longer than my kudu horn. And if you remember earlier in the show, I was able to get three notes out of the kudu horn. Let's see how many notes I can get out of my hunting horn. You count with me at home. Did you hear them? Four wonderful notes out of this hunting horn. The neat thing is, remember the early song I played without any valves on my French horn? Those same four notes exist in my hunting horn. So just by moving my lips fast and slow, on a simple horn, we can start to get simple music. But again, as human beings, we're never satisfied. And so they had some smart people who said, what would happen if we made our horn longer? Now, you can't see the length of this one, but I did measure it out. And if we stretched it out, it would be about 10 feet long. What we're learning today, the longer the horn, the more notes we can play. Still a place for my mouthpiece. Remember we talked about the cone and conical tubing. If you look at this horn, you notice how small it is where I put the mouthpiece. And if you trace the horn around, you notice how it gets a lot longer until eventually it comes out the big bell. So the small hunting horn played only four notes. This one can play a lot of notes just by my buzzing my lips slow to play low. Or buzz them a little bit faster to play higher. And of course, with all those notes, it's still hard to play real music. For example, you all know the nursery tune Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Are you aware that Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is over 250 years old? And it was composed by the famous musical genius Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Here's what Twinkle Twinkle Little Star sounds like on a horn such as this. Do you notice something's missing? All I can play are the natural notes. Well, during Mozart's time, there was a really inventive horn player who wondered what it would be like if he took his hand and he put it inside the bell. And so he did that, and he sort of moved it around a little bit. Listen closely. You notice, just by using my hands and my lips, I'm able to play a scale. If we wanted to do Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, imitate what Mozart heard about 250 years ago, I use my hand and my lips. And this
this is what the horn players had to do to make music up until the time that that two-valve French horn was invented, about 1824, while Beethoven was writing his Symphony No. 9. So we have all these wonderful instruments, and I talked to you about how I buzz my lips slow and fast to play the high notes, but can you really see me buzzing my lips faster and slower? <laughs> Hopefully you can hear the different sounds, but I brought along a really curious instrument where I can actually show you what I am sort of doing with my lips. This is called a twirling tune pipe. You notice there's nothing inside. It's nothing but a hollow plastic tube. The little kids know what to do with this. They say, oh, Mr. Pink, you just spin it over your head. But then how does it make noise? It's very curious because the air gets pulled into one end of the tube. It vibrates against these ridges and comes out here as sound. So when I spin it, you notice nothing's coming out right now. But if I get it to the right speed, all of a sudden you hear one note, just like I buzz my lips. But if I want to change notes in my hollow tube, I have to make the air vibrate faster, so I spin the tube faster. You hear the note change? And if I want to play a higher note, and if I go really crazy and play a really high note, it's a low, soft note. Just by vibrating the air at four different speeds, we get the four different notes. So that is how we make the sounds. We have some pretty basic instruments also. I don't know how many of you watched the World Cup soccer matches about three years ago. This horn comes to us from South Africa. It's called a kudu horn. You notice it has the conical shape of my French horn, small at one end, big at the other. It has its own built-in plastic mouthpiece and it has a bell. If I just blow in the kudu horn, you notice nothing comes out but air. Now this is a really loud horn, so I'm going to blow it away from the microphone, and I'm pretty sure you'll still be able to hear what I'm doing. Did we peg the needles up to the red zone? <laughs> it's an amazing instrument. Now I'm only one person playing the kudu horn in the studio today. Can you imagine 20,000 of me playing this horn in a soccer stadium? It sounds like a bunch of angry bees. If you want to see and hear what it sounds like, go to YouTube and put in the words K-U-D-U. -U. Not the kudu horn of there. This one is not a kudu horn. It's called a vuvuzela. Can you spell that word? V-U-V-U-Z-E-L-A. And the Vuvuzela has about 15 YouTube pages of videos. There are even people who will teach you how to play the Vuvuzela on YouTube. So the Vuvuzela, a one-noted instrument, but it really can play it loud. So we've had all these strange instruments. We also have children's size horns. And this is nothing but a miniature horn. And it's got three cute valves on it right here. But again, the bell is so small, I just usually hold it with my thumb inside. But it plays many notes, just like a trumpet or a French horn. You could even take this one down to New Orleans and play the Mardi Gras song. So we have the miniature French horn. Also, we are not just stuck with the certain sounds you hear me playing. I'll stand back here by the table a little bit because I have a bunch of things that we actually, other than my hand, 
which can also, like my old French horn, I can change the notes by using my hand in the bell. But we also have some accessories for our horn. These are called mutes. They fit right inside the bell. The string on it is so that when we play in an orchestra, sometimes we have to put the mute in, take it out very fast. Here's the open sound. You put the mute inside. It makes it softer and changes the tone color. We also have another mute. And if you look closely, they're both the same red and white color. But if you look on this one, you'll notice the cork goes all the way around the top of this mute. Whereas on this mute, there are only three stripes of cork, which lets the sound come out of the bell. In this mute, there are really teeny little black holes in the white stripe where my fingers are. You put this mute in your horn, all the sound is forced inside this mute. And this is what this one sounds like when you play. Can you hear anything? It's called a whisper mute. When a conductor is really picky and wants us to play as soft as possible, I've known, been known at times to put this mute in my horn and play in the orchestra. But it also comes in handy when I'm staying overnight in a hotel and I need to practice my horn because it absorbs all the sound and I don't disturb all the neighbors. Now the other cute mute we have is a brass mute. And this almost takes the place of my hand, except my hand cannot seal the bell 100%. And so some air leaks out around the edges. With this mute, it's again 100% cork. And probably sometimes during concerts you've heard parts of the music where the conductor or the composer wants us to imitate a laughing sound. And this mute seals the bell, forces the air through this teeny little throat right here, and then it comes out here. And that's called a stopping mute, similar to what I have with my hand. Only it makes the sound a lot brighter and easier to hear. But if you don't have time to use the little stopping mute, we've always got our hand available to us to stick it into the bell. So we have the modern horn. We have all the accessories. From all of these beautiful instruments, of course, and this is the wide shot, we have this gorgeous horn, which I'm sure you're sitting at home going, Ricola.